Okay, the recording started now. So I just let everybody come into the room. People are filing in now. I can see them. Um, we've got uh, somebody called Calvin Smeader in the room. I think he's from Liverpool or somewhere like that. Very, very country. <laughs> Roger, one thing, if I use American expressions or initials that don't translate, tell me to do it in non talk too quickly because I have many cups of coffee with my American accent to make it slow down. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. That's what we like. <laughs> One time I was being translated at a meeting into like 10 languages, some global meeting, and I had taken the all night flight and had like 20 cups of coffee. And I was talking incredibly quickly. And the translator came, one of the translators came out and kneeled in front of the translation booth and said, please talk slower. You're translating when you talk incredibly quickly like you're American. <laughs> Surely, if, I, if I break into um, this place where I was born, it's, uh, it's uh, an area called the Black Country, and we have a particular accent there, which I think is the best accent in the whole world, actually. But only only those of us from the Black Country can really understand that it's the problem. <laughs> and um, I have a tendency um, that when I really get going on something, that I'll I'll fall into a load of Black Country as well. Um, so. Yeah. Um, we'll correct each other if it comes if we need to. We'll do that. When I moved from New York City, just and I know it's starting in a second. For those who are listening, we're just getting ready. Um, to North Carolina, when I went to work organizing apparel workers, people had no idea what I was saying because I would talk quickly and everybody would say, "Whoa, what country? <laughs> Slow down." <laughs> Oh gosh, that is okay. funny. Monica, when you're ready, when you're ready. All right, yeah, shall we, shall we kick off? All right, well, just a quick introduction and welcome to everybody. I think people will be dipping in and out. People have got different challenges at home or wherever they're calling in from, um, particularly as far as IT and um, internet access goes, etc. But you're really, really welcome. We're really pleased to have everybody here and particularly our two guest speakers here today, um, Stephen Lerner and Roger McKenzie. But before we get into that, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, you can find the controls panel on your, it usually hovers around on the right hand side. Um, so just, to, just if you need to increase um, the volume, etc. If you can't hear the speakers, just log in and out and try a different format. There's different formats in there. Um, that we we are um, there's a number of grey bars with audio and dashboard, etc. And you can minimise your control panel if you want to get a better view of what's happening on the screen. Um, if you're having problems hearing the presenters, you can check and check your speaker settings under the audio button. So have a look at that. Um, if, if you have any questions, just get in touch afterwards. We're keeping it straight through because we know how busy people are and we're trying to keep the time down today. So it will be under an hour today, hopefully. Um, we are looking at, we know, we understand how busy people are and people are taking time out to do this today. So um, we're gonna keep it as tight as we can. And so before we get involved and get everybody going, I think I've mentioned everything there. Is that, is that everything, guys? I think so. You're happy with that? Yes, yes. It's just nod. That's fine. Um, we, I'm going to introduce first Roger McKenzie, who is our esteemed Assistant General Secretary here at Unison. So over to you, Roger. That's the first time Monica's ever called me esteemed or anything remotely nice oh, actually i think that's what i think that's we're nice listening. We're listening. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank, thanks monica and um welcome stephen um, um I'll, I'll do a little introduction um to stephen um i mean like i think many people i've heard um over the years a lot about the um the, the famous um, justice for janitors campaign but um Never met Stephen, heard heard his um, reputation and stuff. But I remember my, my friend and mentor um, is a guy called Bill Lucy. Um, and um, Bill um, said to me one time, he said, um, when I was going over to the States, you really must 
um, find a chance to to meet Stephen Lerner. Um, and I think you live around the corner from each other, I think, yes. as well, don't you, Stephen? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, <right>. So, <laughs> so, um, so I did, I did get that opportunity and it was well worth it. And we've been talking on and off for a little while now. Um, Stephen, I think, is one of the most interesting organisers that I've met anywhere. And um, so the chance for us to be able to have this discussion, um, I think, is kind of long overdue, actually. Um, so I guess the, one of the things that we can thank, probably the only thing that we can thank the pandemic for, is an opportunity to have some more of these discussions, really. And just to reflect a little bit, um, on some of the challenges that we face as organisers um, and the different ways of being able to meet those challenges. But rather than just being um, a kind of reactive kind of organising, reacting to situations that are in front of us, one of the things that um, I wanted to, to have, well, I was pleased to have this opportunity to talk with Stephen this afternoon is to start thinking ahead a little bit and just to start thinking about some of the ways that we can be proactive to build what I always talk about, which is a, um, a movement that's going to really make a difference for, for working class people, not just in this country, um, but elsewhere. And so um, can I um, really, you know, from the bottom of my heart, um, welcome you, Stephen. I know you're really, really busy, as people will hear. Um, shortly some of the campaigns that you're involved in but I'm really genuinely delighted that um, you've been able to um, join us. I suppose the starting point Stephen, tell us a little bit about yourself. A little bit about myself. Um, where to start? You know it, it, it maybe I'll start with um, how I got involved in in the movement which you know I grew up in New York City, unions were a fact of life, lots of family members were union members but it wasn't like it was central to my thinking. It was just one of the things that people did. Um, and my family originally came to the United States, um, my grandparents from Poland and Russia. And, but I had this experience, I don't know if you've heard of a group called the United Farm Workers Union and Cesar Chavez. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. And the truth is I sort of stumbled into it, which is I met some folks and they said over the summer, well, why don't you be a volunteer and help us? Because they were on strike and they had launched a boycott of lettuce and grapes. And to make a long story short, I ended up moving in with a family of strikers um, who had moved from California to New York to launch a boycott of the stuff they were on strike. And all I can do is say, I really do, and I was, I think, 16 at the time, is I fell in love. I fell in love with the idea that workers could take on the most powerful corporations, in this case, agribusiness in the world, and not just fight for justice broadly, but transform their own lives and go from being dismissed as just a, as a farm worker to leading giant movements. And this is not something I talk about a lot, but um, I fell in love with the movement and I dropped out of high school and became an organizer because it just felt like there was nothing more important to do than work with people who wanted to transform their lives and transform our country. I, I, th I, think, I think that's one of the things that we've been talking about um, a lot here amongst our organizers is that um, we, we get small wins every now and again. Um, there's a lot of setbacks, obviously, but we get small wins. But actually, it's that big vision of big change um you know really changing the sector that we are really really interested in and you know it's in, it's interesting that your kind of start really came with um the um, chavez and the rest of the comrades who are involved with that farm workers um, movement because against all the odds really and um, they try to um organize a whole sector reorganize a whole sector can you tell us a little bit more for those people who are listening to this who maybe don't know um, what what Chavez and the farm workers were doing there? Well, if you think about the the, the late 1960s and 19 and early 1970s in the United States, there was this idea that we had arrived and it was prosperous and everybody was in the middle class and doing great and and poor workers and especially workers of color were invisible. It's like it didn't count that they were poor and 
So Chavez started forming a union of migrant farm workers. Um, they were significantly from Mexico, but from the Philippines, from all over the world. They were brought to the United States to be cheap labor. And he started forming a union um, of farm workers, but the idea behind the union was not just raising wages and benefits, but it was building a broad movement of poor people. And what the union did spectacularly is they realized that it wasn't enough that workers wanted the union. It wasn't enough to go on strike because these companies were so powerful, they were just bringing scabs and they needed a broader strategy. And what the union did is launched a boycott of those products of lettuce and grapes. But when most unions launch a boycott, it's just words. But what, you know, meaning they say we should boycott. But what the union did that was so amazing is that farm workers from all over California went, left their homes and traveled all over the United States and actually all over the world to launch the boycott. And in launching the boycott in a serious way, they then connected to all different other kinds of movements because this was at the same time other movements were forming. So it became more than just the struggle of the farm workers. It became the struggle of the poorest people taking on the richest people and it really captured the imagination of the entire country. So I, one way to look at it is they did the nitty gritty work you have to do as an organizer. They built their committees, they had picket captains, they knew where every worker was for or against the union. They went to people's homes. So they did the nitty gritty that you have to do. It wasn't like they announced one day, let's have a strike. They spent years quietly organizing. But then when they had the big strike, they said our only that the strike is one tool, but building massive public support is the other tool. And you, this was also at a moment where, um, where especially where both in the African American community and the Latino community there were big movements uh, to demand justice and to fight racism and anti-immigrant feelings. So the union captured all of that at once and became the symbol of the rising of the poorest to demand decent treatment. So so within that, I mean I mean you you've mentioned the African American community and the and the um the, the Mexican community. I mean was were there good links between those communities um in this fight or were they quite separate? Well they I think they were parallel in the sense that this was happening at the same time. Farm work um and in some places like Florida where the workforce was Jamaican and had significant numbers of black workers, it was connected. In, in other places, the employers purposely hired by racial category um, as a way to divide people. So I'd say they were connected as part of the broader movement and also because Cesar Chavez, the president of the union, was a big believer in nonviolence. And so using nonviolent civil disobedience, he went on multiple hunger strikes. And at the same time that other movements were also like Dr. King was talking about nonviolence as a tool. So but I would say they were they were not deeply intertwined, but they were part of something that was broadly happening. I mean, it's quite, again, an, an interesting perspective there in terms of um, the way that employers hired by um, by nationality, by ethnic origin or whatever. Um, similar thing happened in the UK. Um, so as um, as the colonies, the British colonies started to um, to break up, um, and more people were being hired into this country to do the jobs that you know the, the kind of English community, the, the white community, didn't want to do. What was re what was happening there was that so you look at South Asians working in the textile industry in in specific parts of the UK um, because you know, kind of racist tropes like, well, Asians are more nimble with their fingers so that they can do that kind of work. And, and they were very explicit about that sort of stuff. And, and, and then um, people of Caribbean descent were bigger and all of this sort of stuff. So therefore they should do work on the railways. Um, so people were being particularly hired for um, so-called ethnic traits. Um, and so employers all over the world do this, and I, I think that's a, an interesting thing. I suppose the, the key thing is the, the organizing response 
um, to that and, and trying to make sure that um, we're not allowed to be divided against each other either geographically or within workplaces because again where I come from in the black country um, you know it's a good mix of Asian and Caribbean communities but still doing very very different jobs during the 1950s 1960s um, so foundry work predominantly for Asian workers um, the railways um, and bus driving um, predominantly for um, the Caribbean community um, and really not that much of a mix in those workplaces, but actually quite a strong um, um, effort to divide workers by the employer. And it has to be said in those times during the 60s and 70s by a number of people within the trade union movement as well. But we'll come on to some of that, hopefully, um, kind of later on about the role um, of trade unions um, as well. So what is it you actually did with the farm workers then because I mean you know you're coming out of New York and you you know you're kind of coming yeah, out onto yeah I worked on what we called the boycott which is we right. went we organized people not to buy lettuce and grapes so we formed committees in different cities and then we would pick at grocery stores um and say don't buy lettuce and grapes I could still do the chants for you and sing the song um so I worked first as a um on the boycott and spent a little bit of time in California. Um, and from there, um, I ended up um, after the farm work was doing a series of regular jobs. Um, I worked as a housekeeper at Long Island Jewish Hospital. I worked in a nursing home. I ended up, if um, I don't know if anybody, I used to make in Rhode Island, the earring cards, you know, the little plastic thing that when you buy earrings are hanging on. I was an extrusion machine operator doing that. <laughs> but um, actually, it was a, it, the, the joke there was you'd say, this is a little sick American humor, but it was a, um, is you'd say to the old guys, what's the retirement plan? And they'd hold up their hands and almost everybody was missing digits because we were threading plastic through these automatic cutters. And in, in Rhode Island, you got more money the more the finger was cut off. You know, you got like $1,000 for the first digit. And so the old guys would say, almost ready to retire because they would just have stubs in their hands. Um, it was, that's a little bit of American humor. Oh, wow. But, um, but you know, I, I worked, I got married very young, I had kids very young, that's all another story. But, um, but I ended up, I was, from those jobs, I wanted to be a union organizer and ultimately got hired by a union that no longer exists, the International Ladies Garment Workers Union which was actually the union that my family, when they came to the United States joined, because they were, when you were talking about sort of people go to certain jobs, Jews from Eastern Europe became garment workers. That's what you did when you came to New York. Um, and then I moved to the Southern United States, which is the most anti-union part and organized in all sorts of rural communities, garment workers and um, worked on many long and, um, vicious and incredibly violent strikes um, in the southern United States for many years. Yeah. So, so fast forward a little bit, how did you um, end up at the SEIU, the Service yeah. Employees International Union for people who don't know? So it's a very funny story as I worked on a number of different organizing campaigns and the Service Employees International Union originally had started as a union of janitors at the turn of the last century. And over the years had expanded into lots of other healthcare public. And the janitorial part of the union was dying and they were almost ready to give up. And so since they were ready to give up, they couldn't figure out how to deal with the subcontractors and part-time work and no benefits. And so they hired me and some other crazy young people um, to start organizing janitors. And really what was fascinating was the reason we were allowed to do it is because they were ready to give up. They were saying it was impossible. And the starting of Justice for Janitors was people saying it's impossible to organize what we call undocumented workers, people without papers. It's impossible to organize them, et cetera, et cetera. So they said, do what you can do. And without restrictions, we started the Justice for Janitors campaign and it really built on the idea of the farm workers union. 
which is that you're both organizing workers, but you're organizing the public, and then you have a deep analysis of who really has power and that you have to do all those things at once. And it's actually a funny story. We started in a place called Denver, Colorado, and very quickly organized a thousand workers, which was an enormous breakthrough at that time. And the thing about it was we were successful partly because we didn't know what we were doing. Uh, because if we had obeyed all the rules, we would have lost. And so I remember this moment, we have something called the National Labor Relations Board, which is our labor court. And I didn't even understand what the law was. So we were in violation of many laws, I won't, um, about how you're supposed to conduct yourself. And I'll never forget the government agent saying to me, you're not making this up. You really don't know what you're doing is illegal. And I said, no, I don't know that. I just am organizing workers. But Denver became the activator of the campaign. And uh, uh, it was like the experiment and a couple interesting things happened there. One, it was one of the first campaigns in the United States where we said, we are organizing workers whether or not they're legally here. And we were very public that if an employer hires you, you have the right to have a union and we're gonna organize you because much of the US labor movement was opposed to immigration. And early in the campaign, our entire organizing committee was arrested and deported. Um, I mean, those are the kinds of obstacles we face. And so we started experimenting with all different tactics. One of the earliest things we did, um, I think the statute of limitation is up, so I can talk about this, is we were organizing the cleaners at the airport. And so we got a lot of people in cars with no union insignia and their cars broke down and drove slowly all around the airport, shutting down the airport. <laughs> and nobody really said we were doing it. Um, and so all the news report, massive traffic jams at the airport. And what was fascinating about it is the bosses knew it was us. Workers were so excited because janitors are the invisible people that come in at night. And all of a sudden, all the news was, why is the airport shut down? And so what we tried to do was in addition to the good organizing, meaning we mapped every building, we knew every worker, what shift is that we then made the campaign larger than life. We ended up, this is a this very funny story. We had done this thing where we delivered over Christmas in Santa Claus suits. Um, we delivered coal to some of the biggest um, building owners. You know, we went in and, the, and, then, and then Santa Claus got arrested. Um, uh, <laughs> during a justice janitor shirt or something. And not only was it huge news, but what was so fun about it is the police chiefs union not the union the police chiefs association had a calendar and we became december was a cop with this funny look on his face like i can't believe i have to do this arresting the justice for janitors um <laughs> santa claus so, so what i'm getting to is from the very beginning the campaign was not just join the union to get a little bit more money the campaign was we are here in this country we're invisible we're exploited we're treating we are now in the public and it was, we fought in a way that not only put pressure on the building owners, but it also gave workers a sense that I am liberating myself from my conditions. So, so that, that liberation, um, I mean, I mean what, what, what did that look like in, in, in practice in terms of what, 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 what was actually achieved um, by the Justice for Janitors campaign? Well, if you, if you, well, let me go back one, one thing. And the key thing about the Justice for Janitors campaign is we said, we may be played by, paid by the cleaning contractor. You know, that's the entity, the ISS or whatever, the, some of the same companies. But we said, we had an analysis that said the real power are the building owners, even though that they had decided to subcontract. So one of the key things we did is we deeply researched the industry and we realized that the cleaning contractors were just payroll agencies. It was the building owners who paid the bills and the building owners in fact, got much of their money for their capital from pension schemes. And one of the early things we did in Justice for Janitors is we got $1 trillion of pension scheme money, meaning the assets, to say they would no longer invest in any building 
if the workers were not treated decently in that building. So I, I'm going to come back to your question, but we had what we would call a comprehensive approach. How do you organize workers? Then how do you organize a community? We always had community organizers and union organizers. Then how do we impact capital at every level? And in combining this, the, the best way to describe it is um, we had a building that we were trying to organize and um, the moment when the group of workers all of a sudden felt the combination of all of that gave power that the supervisor came in and basically said, you can't join the union. And all of a sudden we were marching on the boss, the entire building. And you could just feel people's excitement because they had been terrorized by the supervisor when the supervisor ran away. <laughs> And then, I mean, literally ran. And so it was the combination of those things. And then people started all talking about janitors who nobody talked about, you know, because people work at night. So the victory in Denver then spread us all over the country and jumping to the future over the life of the campaign. I think we organized 200,000 new workers. We doubled wages. We won health insurance. We ran enormous giant strikes. And all of that was very much tied to especially uh, Latino immigrants, what was the rising of that community. And uh, I'll jump way ahead. Um, I don't know if you know the story of the Century City police riot, Roger? No. no. So in 1990, we struck out Los Angeles. And to make the long story short, we had a big march and um, the police moved in and attacked us and uh, 60 people were, were hospitalized. Two women actually miscarried. They were beaten so badly. It was really just, and they were chanting racial epithets as they beat people. But um, this was all filmed from the helicopters above the traffic helicopters. And it became all over the world, became known as the janitors being attacked. Um, and that's what led to this, actually, the, uh, the uh, European labor movement, specifically the Danes and the Swedes, putting pressure on their companies to be union. But it was that battle. And this is, I don't know if you know the movie Bread and Roses. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is captured in that movie. And if anybody ever watches it, there's real live, the worker committee in the movie is watching the real footage of the police beating. So if you ever watch about three seconds, there's a guy with a great big beard who had hair then, that was me. So you can see me on the ground being clubbed by the cops. Um, and but, but what happened where I'm going in the story is they beat us, we were treated, we go to this public park. And I'd say the, the Americans, people born in America, were like shocked and appalled. How could the police do this? And I'll never forget one of the El Salvadorian workers saying, are they done? Is that it? In my country, they'd shoot us now. <laughs> and it was like this cultural phenomena, which is the Americans were like, yeah. how could this happen? And literally, the most of the janitors were saying, oh, this is what they do to us every night um, when they catch us in an alley. This is how the police treat people of color. So we became the symbol, not just of poor workers. We became the symbol of all the abuses that workers face. So the movement of justice for janitors was much more than we're not paid enough. It was the invisible workers coming out, confronting their oppressors and beating them. And it became the symbol of a whole Latino uprising in the United States. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um... I mean, I, I remember following some of the stories around um, some of the workers, um, Latino workers in particular, basing some of those campaigns around um, May Day um, and some of the marches that, that have taken place around that, um, um, which have been really inspiring to, to many of us to see that people are, are standing up and celebrating who they are, yeah. um, but recognizing that they're part of something bigger um, as well. Um, and I, I just think that's so important. I mean, with, I mean, one of the things that the um, Service Employee International Union is known for, and I should say, one of my best pals, um, Jerry Hudson, is the around the treasurer. He's also another my... one. I mean, this is like Union Corner where you live or something. I think the Union neighbourhood. 
Um, but um, so um, one of my great friends, um, love them to pieces. Um, one of the things that the SCRU is really known for um, is um, really insisting on um, a, a bigger organizing approach um, by the labor movement um, in, the, in the US. Um, and, and I think partly because of that, um, or mainly because of that even, um, there was a, 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 there was a, it was felt that there was a need to set up something different to the AFL-CIO, which for those listening um, is the American Federation of Labor Committee of Industrial Unit Organizations. I think that's right. Um, so, Congress of Industrial Organizations. Congress of Industrial Unions, um, which is a real big story in itself, um, the CIO. Um, part of the, the movement, um, real serious organizing. Um, John Lewis, if I remember right, was the key mover behind that. Yes. Um, and so they they left the AFL-CIO, so the American TUC, the, the shorthand, and moved away to form um, Change to Win. Um, how, how did you see that particular moment within the um, within the labor movement over there? Because for, for many, that would be seen as a kind of catastrophic split, really. Um, you know, looking at, you, you want a united labor movement. Um, but so here we have some of the biggest unions splitting off, form a separate um, federation. How, how did you view that? So it's really complicated, um, both what happened then and where it's played out. So I wrote an article called A New Architecture for Labor. Um, that talked about one of the problems in the United States labor movement is that every union had become a general workers union and we're not focused on sectors and industries and proposed that the US labor movement should really align that we needed somebody to think about each sector. And so I wrote this article, which a lot of people read and um, I did not in the article actually advocate a split, but I advocated that there needed to be a reorganization. So I think where the split came from was just the frustration that so many unions were just about business, about business as usual, and things were getting worse and worse. And there was a collection of unions that were saying, we have to do big organizing. And that meant specifically um, in the case of SCIU saying that 50% of all of the internet, that the national union's money would go to organizing, that there was a mandate that every local, what you would call a branch, had to put, I think, 20% of their resources into organizing. So there were, it wasn't just the rhetoric of we need to organize, it was very concrete steps. We then changed SEIU so that one part of it talked about property service, one about public sector, we reorganized it. So we made all these changes and actually grew a million members. And so there was this urgency of, um, of change and then that led to a group of unions wanting change at the AFL it didn't happen and that led to a split um to be honest and I may make a lot of people mad about this I think the split in many ways became much much to do much to ado about nothing because on the local level meaning in cities people continued to work together as a united labor movement in most cases and change to win I think has become more an organizing hub. It's not really, you know, some unions left and went back to the AFL, some unions stayed in. So I don't think it met the ambition, which was to become the new Congress of Industrial Organizations. Um, so when I look back, I, I don't think that, I don't think it was a decisive moment for good or bad in the labor movement, because we're basically in the same position now of you know continued decline and now in the face of you know Matt you know pandemics and all of that. Yeah, I, I want I want to come come on to um, the, the the issue of um, the kind of um, decline in um, numbers certainly of the density of the U.S. trade union movement. I mean I mean where I mean this is not something that's solely um, afflicting the US trade union movement, um, obviously across the industrial world, really, um, the you know, trade union movements have taken a hit. We can, we can point to individual unions like our own, which have held its own 
you know, in terms of 1.3 million members um, consistently for the last 20 years or more. Um, but um, what um, I want to look at really is some of the, the responses to that kind of decline. Um, and one of the responses is a certain organization called Bargaining for the Common Good, um, which um, you are the architect of. Could you say a little bit about what Bargaining for the Common Good is about and how that is, um, I've, I've characterized it as, a, as, part, as part of the response to that kind of decline. Um, maybe that's wrong. So what's your perspective on that? Well, to do the, to the, the one minute history of the US labor movement, we hit our peak in density, 35% of private sector workers in the 1950s. And as the economy grew, the percentage of union members kept shrinking, but in a way people didn't realize it because our numbers were even. So the membership wasn't actually dro dropping, but our power was dropping. And much of the US labor movement, you know, we use the expression business unionism. I don't know if you use, use that similar expression, yeah. but organizations I think became increasingly narrow. Our business is to try to get a little bit better wages and benefits and insurance for people. And unions didn't, as part of their work, think about how does this connect to people's larger lives? That people are whole people. They work somewhere, their kids go to school somewhere, they live in a neighborhood, they can't afford housing. And so what we started to think about is there's sort of two trains of thought in the US labor movement. One is what I call um, the rose colored glasses people, which look to the past with rose colored glasses and say, if we could just go back to when unions were strong and they forget that when unions were strong, they also in our country, women couldn't be in, black people couldn't be in the union. And in fact, the US labor movement in many cases was aligned with terrible policies, both internally and externally. So there's a group of folks, why I call it rose colored glasses, they remember the good part that unions were strong, but they don't remember the part that unions were not part of trying to really improve society in the broadest way. So the simple idea behind bargaining for common good is let's expand what we negotiate about at the bargaining table. So it's not just wages and benefits, but it's a whole array of other issues. So I'll give a very specific example. The teachers union in um, uh, St. Paul, Minnesota, put on the bargaining table that the school district, that's the entity that employs them, would not do business with any bank that foreclosed during the school year. The logic was simple. What is the biggest obstacle to education outcomes? If you if you're, don't have a place to live. And so the idea behind bargaining for common good is to partner with community and other groups and create demands that, mean, that aren't just wages and benefits that make the union and their partners at the center of social transformation. And so all these different unions around the country, we just had a strike in Minnesota, the janitors, had what we think is maybe the first climate strike, authorized climate strike in the US labor movement. The janitors union did research that 70% of the greenhouse gas emissions in Minneapolis come from office buildings. They then proposed that janitors be trained as green technicians to make the buildings less polluting. And then they went on strike over that issue. And like people could not believe that janitors were striking over climate change. But when the strike happened, at the same time, the youth climate strikers went on strike with them. And it became a whole movement in, in Minnesota. But the most powerful part of this was that the workers who are mainly immigrants um, talked about they were in the United States because they were climate refugees. The Guatemalan said that I had to leave my farm because the environment's changed so much that I could no longer be a farmer. So the idea behind bargaining for common good is let's look at all the things in people's lives and let's unite labor community and other people and bargain and have fights about that. The most recent one, the Chicago Teachers Union went on strike. I don't know if this got press in your country, 25,000 people. One of their demands, which they won, was about homelessness. And the mayor of Chicago said, just think about how much you want to get paid in your pension. They said to the union, why are you being utopian? 
and trying to negotiate about homelessness. And the union said, you're right, we are utopian. That is what a union is. A union is a utopian movement saying this could be a better world. But the key part of this is instead of what happens in the United States is the right wing tries to claim overpaid public employees, all they care about themselves, is the strike became a community strike about the future of Chicago. And so that's what we're trying to do in bargaining for common good is connect to community groups as equals, develop demands. We actually, when we go to negotiations, don't just go with our worker committees and negotiators. We bring community members to the bargaining table. And so it totally has changed how that does. And, and some people say to me, well, are we gonna give up on economics when we raise issues that aren't just bread and butter? And our experience has been it's the opposite, that when we enlarge what we bargain about, when we build a broad movement, we get more in economics because we're much stronger. We're not, I mean, good. Go ahead. Um, I, was, I was just gonna say, I, was, I mean, you were talking about um, the thing that, um, you know, you're bargaining about things that impact on people's lives, you know, really kind of immediate things. I suppose the biggest impact on all of our lives at the moment is the pandemic. Um, and um, I mean, so has, has bargaining for the common good um, and the trade union movement, what's been the sort of response so it's um, yeah, to the um, pandemic? The, the bargaining for common good network in key cities, especially some of the teachers unions, but not exclusively, were leaders in a whole set of broad demands from closing the public schools, but we then turned the public schools into feeding, to, but they didn't just say close the schools for safety. In city after city, that became the food, is still the food source for people that the, they're making food. And literally in some cities, the bus drivers are now delivering food to the neighborhoods where students who were eligible for food lunch did. So very early on, we've had a whole series of demands and action, both about our workplaces, but also about conditions in jails where COVID is just going rampant. So the question, so we've raised all these issues and taken action on them. I'll give you an example of some of the stuff we are doing. Um, there's a very rich place in the United States called Greenwich, Connecticut. I think we've identified in that area that there's 15 billionaires worth a combined total of $80 billion. So they're doing okay. And I don't know if it's the same in your country, but here, while we now have 20% unemployment, um, the rich are actually getting richer. The, the billionaires have gained $407 billion in wealth. So what we did yesterday is we had a car caravan, we call them nursing home workers, I think you would call them social um, social care workers who have been, I think 12 members of this branch have died. I think 15 members of their family have died, the nursing homes themselves. So we did a car caravan. We're trying to figure out how we start engaging in public activity while doing social distancing. We decorated all the cars and we had a map and we put it all out on the internet before we did it that showed each rich person's address and home. And then we had a little profile of them and then the car caravan snaked through um, their exclusive neighborhoods. We quickly had a very large police escort. And our slogan was money bags for billionaires, body bags for workers. And then as we came to each person's home, and we actually had this interesting technology because we didn't want people to violate social distancing. So everybody in their car was on a something like this. We use Zoom for this. So that's how we gave the speeches, you know, instead of everybody gathering. And then when we got to their houses, we would drop money bags and body bags in front of them and move on. And we're really, we're not claiming this is sophisticated, but what we're saying is all of our members were heroes till about a week ago. Everybody's saying essential workers were sacrificing, but now they want to implement austerity. And the same people that held us as heroes are now saying, you have to take a pay cut. And we're yeah. saying very quickly, clearly, there are people who not only are billionaires, they become multi-billionaires. I don't know if you heard that Bezos is about to become a trillionaire. And yeah. 
Yeah. So we believe, we literally said, we are coming, rich people. We are here. You cannot live in luxury in your mansions advocating tax cuts and that workers should die. And I think that's a key thing that we need to build on this craziness that we're heroes one day and sacrificial lambs the next day and directly confront those folks. And again, the feeling that people have when instead of sitting at home bemoaning their fate, we go directly to the homes of the rich and powerful and say enough is enough. We have, and this is what I think the key part of this moment here is we can do one of two things. We can hope it will pass and we'll go and we'll go back to the unacceptable past. America was a land of inequality and racism and worse and worse working conditions for years. We don't want the, the pandemic to go away and then we just go backwards. We want to use this moment to fight for really transformational change, to redistribute yeah. the wealth, to rebuild a social Absolutely. safety, to build powerful unions. And I think this is the biggest danger we face is when something this horrible happens, I have it too, I, I keep saying, wouldn't it just be great if I could go to a restaurant? But we need to look at this, this is a turning point in history. And if we don't seize it, I really think that we're on a razor's edge. And we are either gonna transform society and make it one, much better, or we really are, in our country at least, heading into like almost a, a form of feudalism. <laughs> where a yeah. handful of super rich people run everything. And so that's the challenge. I, I couldn't, couldn't agree with you more. I, I think that um, where, where I, I was in a meeting the other day, uh, one of these sorts of meetings, and um, I made some remarks and the person who was kind of moderating the discussion um, said, oh, and to, to move on to, um, yeah, I want to, talk about something a little bit more positive than you know the fact that um you know because i was talking about all the um the the way out of all proportion black people are being uh, affected by this um by this virus and so on and how people in my view are being put in harm's way all of this sort of stuff and i'm talking about all these things um and i had to pull her back and say actually um it's probably my fault for not being really clear i'm an organizer and I think that this is a time for organizers now. Um, and I think that that's probably a weird thing to say when we can't go outdoors, um, but actually there's a lot we can do still indoors. And one of the things we can do is get ready for going out um, outdoors, but also we can do some of the things that you were talking about in your example too. Um, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. This is a, a moment where we have to say that what what was going on before wasn't good enough. Exactly. Um, and, we, and we spent years and years saying it wasn't good. So why would we say we want to go back to what wasn't yeah. good? That doesn't make sense to me. But let's do this thing of talking about that better society, that better world for working people that understand, as you're saying, I think, that these things won't happen if we just waiting for somebody to do this for us it'll happen if we take the initiative and make it happen um the final thing i'll, I'll just say around all this is that you know uh, I, th I think you probably have it in the states as well where we we gather as we did last night here at eight o'clock on a um, thursday night and we we all do applause for care workers and you know i mean i i, I couldn't think of a you know there's hardly a group of workers that that um in, in care that you know, they, they absolutely deserve the applause um, that they get, but applause doesn't pay the bills and it doesn't put a roof over your head. Um, and the only way we're going to make that happen is if we organise to make that happen. Um, so you know, let, let's do the applause, but let's also take the opportunity to build the movement that's going to make a difference to working class people. So we haven't got to scratch around and just think that people just, you know, be happy with their lots with which is a, a round of applause on a thursday night actually they need to be able to feed their children and their families and need to keep a roof over their heads and that's what we need to concentrate on doing and that's what i'm always concerned about building the movement and i say in every speech that i give you have to build the movement and what i like about bargaining for the common good and the, the things that you've described this afternoon is um and actually right the way back to the beginning of the discussion when you talked about Chavez 
um, was about it, it takes a movement you know, and somebody talked about it takes a village actually it takes a movement to make a difference and that's what we have to concentrate I think um, on on doing so um, I mean we're moving towards I think um, I think Monica was giving me the evil eye and telling me that we're moving towards the, the end of our kind of time a little bit um, and I'm, I'm never I make it a point of personal um, survival actually never to um, argue with um, with, <laughs> with Monica um, but may, may, maybe maybe two um, two final things um, just to to move towards um, the conclusion and so looking ahead um, you know we've got all of these challenges facing us um, we've got um, the middle of this pandemic where we think it's the middle might be the start might be the I mean who knows where we are with this but what I think um, you know we were chatting before this recording started what I think is um, almost inevitable um, is um, a period of austerity that we're going into um, how, how do you view that as a, a challenge for organizers and presumably I would imagine bargaining for the common good has started to think through some of those issues and how we might be able to challenge some of those things um, have, you, have you got any thoughts on that so yes the the key thing here is if you accept the logic of austerity you've already lost which is if you say oh well we spent all this money so which some people say the the chicago teachers union have a great expression which is they call it broke on purpose which is that you lower taxes you give subsidies to the rich and then when there's no money the bosses say to us well there is no money you have to be rational you know, and so you should take cuts. So I think a big part of bargaining for common good, and I'll describe, is saying that there actually is plenty of money and we are not gonna fall into the trap of negotiating, does one union take bigger cuts than the other because we're just dividing the pie. We need to increase the size of the pie. And we need to talk not just, we need to talk about wages and benefits, but all the conditions in society that lead to people having decent lives so the direct and so like we are gearing up for big strikes we have act just you know we are mapping um every union contract expert. this is the next stage of bargaining for common good and maybe a way to wrap up because monica looks so nervous about the time but anyway i'm Not just <laughs> is that we started to do is the most collective bargaining in the united states are site specific it's not like we have sectoral bargaining so we have put together an interactive map that has the expirations over the next year and a half for 5 million US workers whose contract is expiring. We're then gonna overlay on that map, big organizing campaigns, and then we're gonna further overlay on that, the fights to raise revenue by taxing the rich, because we do that geographically by state. And what we're hoping to do is then create broad, bargaining demands that multiple unions will all adopt with community partners and start synchronizing the natural expiration of, of contracts so that people are negotiating together. It doesn't matter if it's the same table or the same employer, and we're going to identify hotspots all over the United States where there's a critical mass of contract expirations, organizing, and revenue fights. And we are hopeful in the next, and we're building for big strikes, we're building for big battles to directly take on the super rich and the billionaires and the corporations. And we're saying, we don't accept the logic of austerity. There is no need for austerity. We just gave $4 trillion to the corporate class in the United States. And so that to me is the next step is consciously building around workplace and broader societal demand, and then synchronizing and aligning our work with community and other groups to build towards the kind of giant battles that built the labor movement. And just one thing that you said earlier on about movement building is social scientists have actually mapped that unions do not grow incrementally. They grow in bursts at key moments when they're deeply connected to broader social movements. That's what happened in the 1930s, that's what happened. So we are trying to build a social movement for economic and racial justice and social justice of which unions are a key element, but other people are involved. And we think we have to both go back to our roots in terms of militancy, but then look to the future 
about the kind of society that we want to create. And we think bargaining for common good is a critical way to do that. I mean, I mean that's fantastic. Um, I, mean, I, th I think at some point in the future, we're going to have to call you back onto one of these and have, have another chat about how, how you're getting on um, with that. So the final, final question before Monica throws the switch um, is, um, I asked you before, and just to, I'm a big book bookie, basically. I like I like books. I've got loads of books everywhere. And obviously, um, as an organizer, I want to um, be able to to read about organizing and some of the things that um, that we've done as a movement. Have you got any recommendations? So a book, I haven't read it in years, so I say this with some trepidation because it, it was so influential, but there's a book called Poor People's Movements by oh, Francis. Yeah, yeah, I've got and it. That book was one of the most influential books when I was coming up as an organizer because it captured this one, the idea of movements, but then the other thing it talked about was disruption. Yeah. That if we are not disrupting the status quo, this does not happen through being polite. And it's a, it was a brilliant book then, and it really influenced, everybody should read it. And then what I'll lead you with just the funny part of the story, Francis Fox Piven, who wrote it, the right wing just hates her. I mean, she's 88 now. And the right wing during the end, um, right at the other recession, started attacking her as the giant conspiracy theater. You know, they were going after her. So I ended up being in a meeting with her and we were taped um, by some right wing stooge. And then um, they, because I was with Francis, po Francis Fox Piven, this is how important the book is, I was titled by the right wing, um, an economic terrorist, the most dangerous man in, in America, more dangerous than Osama bin Laden. <laughs> because I would hate saying exactly what we're saying now, that we need to build a movement and rich people will change because we confront them and et cetera, et cetera. So Poor People's Movement, a fantastic book. Excellent. I've, 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 I've read it before and I think it's wonderful. Stephen, thank you so much for thank all your time. You. Um, really appreciate that. Um, Thank you, but we'll certainly have you back at some point. Um, to Definitely. Definitely. Thank you so much. We didn't need to worry about the time. I just, just, I did look like I wasn't listening, but there was been different things have been happening offline while you guys have been talking. And there's somebody who's who's listening who's from somewhere called the Great Nation of Wales. I don't, <laughs> I don't know who. That is. But he's um, asked lots of questions. He missed the beginning bit where we said don't ask questions and he kept asking questions. But we'll get back to you, Mark, with those answers. I'm sure Roger will enjoy answering all of those questions that you left. And Ray Burns, I think he's from John Moore University in Liverpool. He said, Don't yeah, stop guy. just enjoying it so much. So we're getting really positive feedback. There's just growing, the numbers have gone up. And we can see, I can see on the dashboard here, um, people's attentiveness, if people are doing their emails while they're listening. But it's been in the 90s. The attentiveness has been in the 90s, which is unprecedented. So well, people are really interested to hear, wonder, which is fantastic. Duncan, I just want to say something while people are still listening, I'm going to send you. So I'm going to send you, there's an organizing magazine in the United States called The Forge. And we just did a special edition on bargaining for common good that has 14 articles from all different perspectives and including two webinars with um, a fantastic one from Chicago with the teachers union. So I'm going to send that to Roger and Monica and you can share it with people because it has okay. incredible detail about all of this stuff. Excellent. Um, oh, that, that, that was a joy. That was a true joy. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah. And um, what I say, stay safe, stay well, all the best to your family and we'll be in touch again soon you take care say hi to all my neighbors that are your friends yeah please. <laughs> yeah, absolutely be careful <laughs> union <laughs> corner all right yes. thank you everybody <laughs> excellent thank Cheers. you so much everyone thank you everybody who's attended um we've never had so many people on an organizing webinar before brilliant absolutely brilliant and um, there'll be more coming up as Roger said earlier and um, just watch this space look out on social media etc we'll have more of these and we're going to ask Stephen back again as well so thank you very much thank you guys take care I'm going to switch off now <laughs>